Welcome back, everyone. We'll start with our next talk. We have here with us today Filip Danic. Welcome, Filip, to HipCon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Philip will uh, talk about um, a little bit more about the DAT project, very interesting project that's actually um, uh, about reinventing the web with decentralized technology, right? Right, yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> the stage yeah. is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Philip Danich. I am a software engineer. I work at a company called Spice Factory here in Belgrade. Uh, and today I'm here to talk to you about the web, specifically a new uh, vision of the web, an early look at a new decentralized peer-to-peer -peer web. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a bit about it. And later, if you stick until the end of the talk, you're also going to see a little demo I've made, a basically a decentralized version of Twitter. So that should be fun. Uh, but before we begin, uh, kind of to break the ice, uh, this room is called Ninja the Cat, right? Uh, just realized that this morning. Uh, so I want to show you what a real ninja cat looks like. So this is Marco. Uh, he is very adorable and very cute. Uh, or at least he looks like it. Uh, he's actually quite an apex predator, a cold-blooded killer. Uh, here he is looking at a new toy. <laughs> and uh, in the dark, he is basically invisible, and you can't even hear him or recognize him. So that's what a real ninja cat looks like. So now let's talk about the web and the internet, OK? Uh, so for a lot of people, uh, those two things kind of sound the same. They use them interchangeably. Uh, you're techie, so I assume you know at least some of the differences between those two things. And if I were to try to explain uh, what the web and the internet are to a non-technical person, uh, I would go with a very um, classic idea that the internet is like the hardware component and that the web is kind of like the software component. And that's not terribly incorrect because the internet is basically a collection of cables and wires that span across the globe, uh, the most impressive of which are these giant undersea cables. And the way you connect to this global network is through an internet exchange point, an IXP. Uh, there's, I think, seven of them in uh, Belgrade and two in New Belgrade. Those are the nearest ones that your packets are traveling through. And, of course, you have internet service providers, right? They build out the infrastructure that you connect to, and you pay them money to access the internet. Uh, and the internet is something that we use every day. We rely on it. Uh, we might even go so far as to say that the internet is probably a basic human right at this point, except that would be a bit incorrect considering that the internet is a business, right? Uh, it is a business that grants a lot of power to certain people who control it more than others. Uh, specifically, governments have the authority to basically implement bans and censorships uh, or, you know, turn off the internet at their whim. And maybe we don't think about it that too much because we actually enjoy a full set of internet freedoms here in Serbia and surrounding countries, especially the EU. Uh, this is what the index of internet freedom looks like. If you're in this bright green country, one of them, uh, congrats, you have uh, basically all the major uh, internet freedoms afforded to you. But you will notice that a lot of countries uh, aren't green. In fact, uh, a lot of them have very strict laws and censorships because of, well, uh, oppressive regimes there that influence them. So. That's not really good, and I urge you to always be vigilant and think about your rights, basically. Now, as for the web itself, uh, I mentioned it's kind of like the software component, uh, maybe a bit uh, unfair to call it that. Uh, it's an information system. It's a, a data sharing model. And its two basic components are URLs, right? Uh, resource identifiers that resolve to IP addresses, that resolve to servers, uh, that help you basically retrieve the files that you're asking. And the other important part is, of course, the hypertext transfer protocol, right? HTTP. It's the lingua franca, in a way, 
It's uh, what you uh, basically need to use in order to build your uh, classic server applications, right? Uh, it abstracts all of the uh, Internet's internal protocols for you. So the interesting thing about uh, the web, as we know it, is that it was uh, supposed to be this brilliant, open uh, place where you can go to find knowledge, information, and uh, basically join these public forums where you can socialize with people in the open, uh, and societies could, uh, the idea was, uh, thrive and advance. But at some point, uh, closed platforms like Facebook uh, have become the internet, basically. Uh, for a lot of people, Facebook is the internet. And not just Facebook, right? Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp. And since 2014, uh, the web has slowly been dying, or at least declining in a way. Uh, I think something needs to change, because it's not really good to surrender so much of your data and freedoms to a single entity, right? Uh, a closed, centralized entity that has the right to ban and manipulate content and own all of your data. You have no transparency over it. Uh, sometimes, you know, that just means you get to see some really creepy and oddly timed ads, right? Uh, not the worst thing in the world, maybe. Sometimes that kind of means that your basic internet, uh, basic democratic societies are in danger, right? Uh, data is power. It can swing elections and it can overturn uh, governments. Another thing about the internet is that we've developed a assumption of connectivity, right? That we are always connected, that we are always online, both as consumers and as software engineers, right? Uh, we are always assuming that our uh, cloud platforms that we depend on will uh, stay online or that we have uh, sufficient backups and redundant replicas and that everything w can always work smoothly. Uh, that's not always the case, right? Uh, for example, your uh, light bulbs could be in danger, right, of crashing for up to 48 hours. Uh, that's one of the silliest things I've seen this year, I think. Uh, basically, AVS was down and Philips Hue light bulbs <laughs> stopped working. Um, but you might be thinking, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world, right? It happens from time to time, but it doesn't influence me too much. Uh, why should I care? I, I think we should care. I think we should care about building what I would like to call offline first peer-to-peer -peer software, right? Software that can still provide its core functionality, even if you are offline, uh, that can still provide a read-only view of the data that is currently on the client, right? Uh, for example, a lot of uh, applications that I use, whenever you turn off the internet, they just show a white screen, and uh, all of the data that was already loaded in suddenly becomes unavailable. And ideally, uh, this software would have uh, peer-to-peer -peer functionality, right? Uh, if the internet is down, uh, me and the guys in the office, we should be able to like start a local network and exchange files, chat messages, or anything. It's a bit dangerous to just rely on a cloud provider for everything. Now, uh, I think this is going to fall uh, deaf on many ears. I don't think it's that uh, critical to everyone, uh, because it happens ever so rarely, right? It's not something that happens all the time. Uh, that is, if you are in the majority of the people on this planet who have access to the internet. Because it matters a lot to the other 42% of the human population that isn't connected to this global network, right? These are people living in Africa, well, largely in Africa, the Middle East, parts of Asia, especially in Indonesia. And they're not going to get the internet overnight. It's going to be a slow process that lasts years and years. But they really need the technology right now, right? They want to be connected within their local community. Uh, they want to be connected with other communities nearby. And they don't really have all that much access, right? 
So is there a solution? Is there any way to connect people without the internet, right? Uh, and presumably without cellular networks as well. So one uh, proposed idea is mesh networks, right? So they are a topology of networks that some of you might be familiar with, where each node uh, that's part of the network basically acts as both the switch and the hub and the router and everything. And they are basically collaborative nodes that uh, work together to uh, let data travel most efficiently between nodes. So the idea for how you would implement this in a local community is you give everyone phones, right? Uh, they're not that expensive to manufacture anymore. And uh, they are probably going to have a Bluetooth, right? And everyone can enable Bluetooth. There is a Bluetooth-based standard for a mesh network that you could start. Uh, and everyone in the local area could basically exchange messages and data between each other. Uh, if uh, the person you're uh, exchanging data is right nearby you, right uh, within your signal range, you could exchange it with them directly. Uh, if they're a bit further away, data could jump between nodes and eventually reach them. And you can add, uh, install basically on rooftops or something, these uh, super nodes, right? These uh, machines that have a uh, larger range, uh, better reliability, and are basically always on. Uh, kind of like a friend who always has 100% battery and is always there to help. So uh, one way for this to work, though, would require a different kind of protocol and a different kind of data exchange model, right? Uh, because you're not connected to the internet. Uh, we're not really in HTTP land anymore, right? And uh, one example is the DAT protocol, right? Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for the uh, content-based web, right? And uh, Beaker Browser is currently the well, I would say the de facto standard for using that protocol uh, on your own. It's based on Chromium. It supports HTTP, so it's building on the shoulders of giants, but also integrating uh, this uh, ability to connect to that. So what is that? So it's a content-based peer-to-peer network, right? OK. Uh, wh what does it uh, work like? Well, uh, content is uh, expressed via this data, uh, that URL. Uh, the first part is the protocol identifier, the second part is the public key, and the third part is the optional file name in case your DAT archive contains uh, multiple files. And a DAT archive is uh, basically uh, kind, of, kind of reminds you of Git because it has versioning, right? Uh, you can keep a version history as the file changes. Uh, and based on this key, you can compute something that's called a discovery key. And if, uh, if somebody else knows uh, this public key, they can compute the discovery key and connect to you if you are seeding this file and uh, basically download it from you. And then they can choose to sort of give back to the community by seeding back, OK? Uh, so that's the basic idea of how it works. You're going to see a demo of all this in case it's not uh, completely clear. Uh, a big part about uh, P2P protocols is how does discovery work, right? Uh, P2P is not magic. Uh, it still needs to be established over a network, and you still need to find the peers you're supposed to connect to. Uh, usually, uh, there exists like a centralized server that's mirroring and that you uh, kind of connect to so you can establish a handshake with the other peer and based on that, establish communication. Uh, Hyperswarm is uh, that, uh, basically, system for this. It works exactly as I explained, but it also works on a local network. So uh, it can work without a centralized server using the discovery keys I mentioned earlier. So uh, now I'm going to show you what uh, Beaker looks like. And I'm going to show you a bit uh, how that works within this browser. And I'm also going to demo this little app called Chirper, which I mentioned, a uh, decentralized clone of Twitter. So uh, this, these slides that I've been like uh, running through, they're actually a website. They're not a um, keynote file or anything. Uh, 
uh, that I've been running in Chrome because Chrome is the only one that has this full seamless full screen mode, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm also sharing these files via that. So as you can see, it's very simple. I just say dot share current directory. And it generated this, uh, awesome, this uh, public key, right? It's sharing it. It's uh, around three megabytes. Uh, and as you can see, there is a file watcher that's constantly uh, looking for changes. And as soon as it detects changes, it pushes them. And uh, other clients that are currently viewing this, uh, they are actually subscribed to the, these updates. So they would be uh, pushed in real time. So if I take this, right, and I go to Beaker Browser, so uh, as you can see, it looks like any other browser right now. Uh, the URL uh, contains that, right? But like I said, it also works with regular HTTP. Uh, and here, maybe you don't see it exactly, but it says uh, that I am currently seeding this file, right? Uh, I am one of the only peers right now that is seeding this data. Uh, but if you wanted to uh, help out, uh, you could open this in your own um, instance of Beaker Browser. And you could basically decide to seed. And you have a lot of transparency over how it works, right? Uh, you have full insight into your network activity. And you can completely control how long you want to uh, see the files for. Uh, you also have a very nice interface for viewing all of the files that you are seeding, right? Uh, and what I really like is that you can actually make a copy, right, from uh, the browser. Uh, the browser itself is kind of like an editor, right? So you can finally fork websites, right? When was the last time you had a pull request merge to Facebook? <laughs> Probably never, but... Uh, Something like that could work with uh, Beaker Browser, yeah. Uh, so that's the basic idea there. Uh, let me show you this uh, cool little app called Chirper, right? Uh, doesn't look like much right now, yeah. Built it in a afternoon. Uh, but we see uh, two links here, like create profile, load profile. Uh, I'm going to go with create. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, that guy, OK? And as you can see, it's asking me for permissions and stuff. So what it did was ask me for permission to access uh, the file system that's going to be associated with this domain. So what happened here is, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Beaker Browser and the additional DAT APIs that it has allow you to basically have uh, a file system within uh, JavaScript on the client. So uh, this created a couple of files for me, right? Uh, my profile JSON file, which is just my username. Followed profiles, which is currently blank. And messages, which are also blank. So let's uh, chirp something, right? As you can see, a message appeared, right? So you have full access to a file system here. Uh, and the basic idea of how that works, I'm not going to sh bother you too much with the code, but I'm sure some of you appreciate it. Uh, you have this new object in the window, uh, in the uh, like global window, uh, called dot archive. Uh, you can ask it. You can use it to ask for permission to access the file system. Uh, it's sandboxed to your app's domain, or rather, the dat URL. You can write files, right? Uh, when it comes to like uh, reading messages, for example. So here's the piece of code that reads the messages you've written, right? The ones that are stored locally for you. Uh, it's basically just reading the file, right? In the messages folder, going through all of them, and then uh, setting up a uh, watcher, right? So that you can uh, push messages as they come in. Discovery is a big part of making peer-to-peer -peer work. So here in the following uh, section, this is my public that URL. If I send this to anyone, uh, they can follow me. Uh, what this actually just resolves to is the files themselves, right? I'm just sharing my personal files with everyone. Uh, they're going to be interested in the messages part, mostly. 
So what I can do is join uh, the live channel, which should have some peers on it. Okay. So for example, H Prime, Ninja the Cat, all other interesting stuff. Uh, I can actually load a profile here of a different account that I have, which of course belongs to Marco the Cat. And I can follow them. And now I get to see all of their uh, interesting chirps, right? And how this has influenced and uh, changed the basic file structure is that I only have like a followed profiles file, which belongs to the key of uh, the user that I followed. It has their username. I don't store all of the messages locally. Uh, you could do that if you wanted to. Uh, instead, uh, what's happening down here is we're basically asynchronously going uh, through all of the messages that they've let us discover. Uh, this is done by instancing a new dot archive with their URL, right? Uh, and then asynchronously going through them uh, via the history object where we can uh, kind of limit ourselves. We don't have to load every single message. Here we are loading the only first 150 chirps and we're reversing them so that they come in order newest at the top. So that was the basic idea, right? Uh, I don't want to uh, basically take uh, time, your time showing you the code. I think that if you're interested, uh, you can find it on GitHub. It's available on my profile, uh, GitHub at Philip Danich. Uh, or you know, catch me after the talk, and I'll show you the code if you're interested, or if you want to know anything else about the DAT protocol. Uh, so yeah. Uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter or visit my website. Uh, I post some blog posts about similar topics to this one that you might find interesting. So thank you. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Any questions for Philip? Yeah, here. Here. Oh. Uh, Hi. Okay, so uh, uh, when you said that uh, you uh, uh, keep uh, getting that uh, uh, that file uh, uh, during the changes, so I was wondering if uh, you use that in uh, low in one of those communities that don't have that many uh, access, uh, that much access to internet and stuff. Okay, so how, how do you access traffic? files if? Nobody has access to the internet. That's the question, right? No, I just uh, meant uh, how heavy uh, will be the traffic for the Bluetooth and stuff. That, that, that's the only thing. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. How much uh, will there be traffic? Uh, how much traffic? Uh, well, I guess that depends on how uh, much uh, content, how much popular you are, I guess, uh, and the, the way the app itself was built, right? Uh, if uh, Chirper were to be a uh, more serious platform, uh, we would uh, maybe set up a super node like uh, we have with uh, Hashbase. Hashbase is basically a service that provides additional rehosting, right? Uh, it's actually free. Uh, so if, if someone was really popular, uh, they could offload the data from their own network and use a centralized service like Hashbase. Uh, or you could, uh, since it's open source, you could spin it up on another node. Uh, alternatively, a chirper could be architected in a way that uh, people who follow you uh, also share your latest chirps, right? So you don't have to uh, carry the weight of sharing and, man and uh, suffering all the bandwidth on your own. There's, way to, uh, there's a lot of ways to offload that. Okay. Thank you, Philip, once again. Thanks. Yeah.